showcasing the work of Molly Dowdett in the solo exhibition of extraordinary paintings and works on paper. I'm also delighted, delighted that we have this opportunity for two dear friends to collaborate on this talk tonight. It provides us with a tremendous opportunity to learn more about their process and their creative journeys. In addition to Molly's labels that share um, much rich material about the individual paintings, I'd like to bring your attention to four sensory boxes that were made by uh, Neve Toomey, one of the team here. After the talk, you might like to check them out as they correspond to one work per wall and enhance your experience of the exhibition. Here are some details of the respective bios of both Sarah and Molly. Sarah Baum is the author of three novels, Spill, Simmer, Falter, Wither, A Line Made by Walking and Seven Steeples, two of which have been shortlisted for the Goldsmiths Prize, and one book of creative non-fiction handiwork, which was shortlisted for the Rathbones Folio Prize. In 2023, Sarah was named one of Granta Magazine's Best Young British Novelists. She lives in West Cork, where she works also as a visual artist. Molly Doughton is originally from North Dakota and has resided between Ireland and the US since 2012. She holds a BFA from the University of North Dakota, a post-baccalaureate uh, from Tufts University in Boston, and an MFA from Byrne College of Art at National University Ireland Galway. Major achievements include the 2013 RHA Hennessy Craig Award, a solo exhibition at the North Dakota Museum of Art, twice awarded, the Elizabeth Grinchields Grant uh, 2022 Arts Council Bursary, and the 2022 acquisition of three works by the Arts Council. Molly has been supported by residencies at the Tony O'Malley Residency in Callum, uh, the Gentle Foundation for the Arts, the Tyrone Guthrie Centre, the Ballon Glen Arts Foundation, and the Vermont Studio Centre. Recent exhibitions include Tyranny of Ambitions at the High Lanes Gallery, cover versions at the RHA, Save the Best Part, Burn Bombs Fargo, North Dakota, and Generation 2022 New Irish Painting here at Butler Gallery. Molly's work is represented in many private and public collections, including Office of Public Works, Butler Gallery, Dublin Law Society, Fidelity Investments, NUI Goalway Arts Office, North Dakota Museum of Arts, Arts Council of Ireland, Highlands Gallery, Drada. She's represented by the <coughs> Gallery Dublin. I'll now pass you on to Sarah Bomb, who will kick off tonight's talk. Thank you both. Thank you. Hello, we have a strange sort of swinging mic, so can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Um, I have a soft voice. We discussed this earlier, and Molly was like, I have a loud American voice, so <laughs> we were going to lean it in my direction. But if you can't hear me, just shout, because you've come all this way, so um, let me know if I drop voice and you can't hear me. Um, this is kind of weird for us, because like, we've been together since, what, yesterday lunchtime? Mm -hmm. So now we're going to have to like switch mode into talking to a room full of people, <laughs> still talking to each other, but with lots of people listening. Um, it's so nice to see such a crowd. Um, uh, so yeah, sorry. So we were talking about how we would have to switch mode. And then earlier I was saying to Molly, this is going to be kind of weird because I'm going to be asking you questions, but I probably actually know the answers to all of these questions. So instead of a talk, it will be sort of a weird kind of performance. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try and seem like I don't know the answers. Um, I wanted to begin by telling the story of how I met Molly's paintings, because in fact, I met her paintings before I met her. And there was this little exhibition um, held by a friend of ours called Sue Mont Montgomery in West Cork, but it was kind of down at the end of a wiggly lane in West Cork. And Sue was building a house and she'd been sort of living in a shed and they were moving into the house. So the shed was empty. This is a very West Cork story. And while the shed was empty, she decided that she'd hold an exhibition of paintings. And they were all women painters. And I think they were mostly kind of local. And I knew Sue and I'd actually written about her paintings and I'd been meaning to go for about three weeks. And I finally went on the afternoon, the closing party, the afternoon of the closing party. And I was kind of going for Sue's paintings. I wasn't really that interested, I have to be honest. And when I got there, one of the first pieces I saw was actually a different painting that had the same wallpaper as... Um, the wedding. Yes, yeah. the wedding room. Yeah, mm -hmm. this painting here. Um, and. I just remember being, it was very small, smaller than anything else. And it had this weird perspective and this weird kind of atmosphere 
slightly creepy, I think, but we kind of have, <laughs> you don't necessarily agree with me. Um, but just, it was the attention to detail, something about the color, it just really intrigued me. And then when I looked around, there was another painting um, by the same artist um, uh, that was in the big, big flood, a painting of a bathroom. So again, an interior room with this strange perspective and these vibrant colors and just this kind of feeling about it. And I said to Sue, oh, who is this person? You know, this Molly Douthit. Um, Douthit, I'm sure I was pronouncing it wrong back then. Um, and she, she then had this sort of story about how, oh, she was this painter from North Dakota and she lived in Bali de Hob in some sort of cabin in a wood or something. And um, she didn't come to the opening night either. So she was instantly kind of mysterious to me. And I was kind of intrigued with this person in the same way I was with her tiny paintings that was so distinct from anything else in the exhibition. And then, of course, in you know, a less sort of uh, quaint story, we got to know each other on Instagram and, uh, and became friends quite quickly. And, uh, and instantly it was sort of like, uh, I mean, I don't think I, I, I didn't immediately go to the cabin. It was a good few weeks. Um, but over that period of time, um, it, it, you sort of built the mystery of the cabin. And then eventually when I saw where Molly lives and works, um, I, I found so much kinship. I mean, I don't know if anyone has read Handiwork, but my book Handiwork is very much about sort of um, the process of making art, this kind of religious devotion almost to something, um, uh, to, to, to ritual and to repetition and to sort of those little, um, uh, those little things that demarcate daily life. And so, uh, and so we kind of built our friendship around this. So that, that was a very long way of building up to my first question or my first kind of topic because um, the, one of the first things that we bonded over was also the starting point of this exhibition. And this exhibition had quite a narrative arc, which we'll try and go through. Mm. The, the first thing was grandmothers. So mm. maybe start by saying, what was this supposed to be, this series? <laughs> what was this supposed to be? This series started out with, um, I think, I've always painted from my past, but from my deep past. And... Uh, my my maternal grandmother was always kind of the the grandmother that I've always bonded most with. She was born um, in in Wandsworth, and she she grew up in Wandsworth, but which is in London. In yeah. London, and so um, there was sort of like this deep connection, I suppose, with her and with her past being a bit unique than other people's grandmothers, um, and then. She kind of had a very difficult life, but then found my grandfather, and they sort of built this magical, beautiful life where everything was intertwined. Mm. In and North Dakota. In North Dakota. It's immigration. In, right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and to make a long story short, they ended up just having this amazing life with beautiful homes, one of which was uh, a lake home that was um, in Minnesota. It was... Um, originally built by a man who was a quadriplegic and he was also from Korea. So it had a very interesting ar architecture for him to be able to get around the house, but then also his own Korean influence, which was something that was completely unique. And then they moved in in the 60s and kind of like built it around a 60s vibe as well. So it had this like crazy character. They had acres of land. Um, there was, it, it was just this strange place that was very normal growing up and now as I reflect on it, that, um, that started influencing the paintings, the, especially like the reds, the layout, all of this. That was the intention of the show. Mm. <laughs> and uh, can I point out, um, that, like I think that what you're talking about, maybe the best one that embodies it is the guest cabin. This one, in fact that has like a bear skin on the wall mm -hmm. <laughs> and the TV with the aerials, which is very 1960s. Um, and the kind of marble table, is that one of those mm -hmm. inlaid? Um, but also there's some lovely, um, the sand gardens and the rock gardens and these mm -hmm. kind of little red railings um, that give me a sense of this place, but also the sort of sense of space with the, um, the circular thing kind of, you know, it just, it made total sense to me when you explain what this home had been. Um, but there was a, I, I clearly remember you making this trip to London and then you came back and you were like this, it had completely changed all of your, I mean, you went to London to research your grandmother, I think initially. Yeah. Yeah. So my intention, my intention was I grew up hearing all these long stories of, of what it was like 
it's, you know, she grew up during the, the war and um, she had all these stories and, and I thought, oh, I'll go to London and I'm going to connect with her past and then I can make these beautiful paintings of what my grandmother's life was like and, you know, you sort of build this up in your mind and then I went there and for whatever reason everything was deflated and I didn't, I don't even know, I, I feel like Sarah probably has a better perspective of what happened after that, but I, I kind of, I didn't, I didn't lose it by any means, but I was just like, oh, crestfallen almost. What am I going to do? And I have this show coming up. I, and I don't know exactly, well, I do know what happened then, was that my life was also changing um, in a way that I completely did not expect. But before that, before that, though, you had come back and kind of said, I can't paint like scenes from my grandmother's life literally anymore mm. because you kind of felt like it just wasn't true enough. You felt you couldn't leave out your own life. Right. Was how I think you expressed it to me. Yeah, so it was like I was starting to... But you did can continue to paint the lake home obsessively. I did, I did, I did. <laughs> I was holding on to all dear hope that this would just transform into something. Um, and I think, you know, as you build any body of work, any book, you sort of realize when you've re reached, like, its pinnacle and you've, you've accomplished what you wanted with that work. Um, and maybe it didn't hold out as long as you had wanted. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I knew that I needed to dive into something else, I suppose. Does that answer it? That, no, that yeah. totally answers okay. it. And I just want to say, because I mean, this is something that will kind of come up again, but we, we bonded because I was writing an essay about my grandmother, who was clearly same generation, and also, as it happened, a Londoner. And uh, she also had this very, it, it was their house, it wasn't a holiday home, but it was just a really atmospheric house. Now it was completely different to the lake house. Like this was in Ballycotton in East Cork, not in Minnesota. <laughs> but it just so, it brought back so vividly to me images from my own grandmother's house. And I've had conversations with people about Molly's work and grandparents' houses and how everyone kind of remembers a grandparent's house in the way that you don't actually remember the house that you grew up in or a parent's house or something. Um, and so this was something that really spoke to me about the paintings. It was how much I remembered my own past, even though it had nothing to do with it. And I thought there was something very powerful about how somebody else's paintings and somebody else's memory could, could bring that out. Um, but yeah, I mean, how my memory of it was that there was a period of time when you continued to paint the lake home and I was like, this is about obsession. This is fascinating because it's about obsession. Yeah. But then reality, like contemporary reality, started to kind of sneak in. Mm. And maybe the, um, the non-breeding females is a good example of that. The non-breeding The bird painting. The bird I shouldn't painting. Keep bird so that's painting. when everything kind of shifted a bit. The bird was, you know, there was this railing at the lake. And this, I don't know, it was probably like a different bird every day, but I was five, so I thought it was the same bird, right? And I was like, oh, bird. And I, I named it Popcorn. And like, I'd be like, Dad, Popcorn's there, you know? And, and it was always this bird that I kind of gravitated towards. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to make a painting of Popcorn. And it's going to be, and it was, it was there. And then, but it didn't feel done. It was just the bird was there. And then Sarah and I... <laughs> <laughs> one of the first things that we kind of talked about was, you know, I think one of your first questions to me actually was, well, how do you do it? How do you survive? How do you do art? <laughs> you know, like, how do you make your life work so you don't have any How do you not have a job? <laughs> yeah, how do you not have a job? And it was, it was almost interrogative. And I kind of said, well, you know, I've limited most things down to like this, this, and this. Uh, you know, I'm never going to have a child. I don't have a dog right now. I don't have a car. I've got and, and I've, I've whittled things down. And so the title of the painting is Non-Breeding Females, but it's, so the title comes from our friendship because we both bonded over this idea that we're not going to have children. Because In order to facilitate our, the, our lifestyes, I guess, yeah, as like, artists. Yeah. These are my children. This is my child, is, is my practice. Um, and so, but then also the bird that I painted is a, is a variation of a finch, an American goldfinch but in an, a, a non-breeding female image of the finch. <laughs> so I guess, the, the, like, the work, it started to not... That's not about the lake home at all. Mm -hmm. That's about my current place and my current sort of situation and my current relationships. Mm. Um, and what's interesting about it now, it's totally different to our finches, so... Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a much more vibrant version, like the non-breeding 
females are quite dull, so it's like their mm. colours go sort of grey and muted. But you've painted it vibrant again, mm. you know, you've kind of brought it back, which is part of painting how, how something feels or what something means rather than what it actually looks like. Mm. For sure, I think, yeah. That sort of sums it up. I'll tell, Don't need I'll to expand. You yeah, <laughs> to tell me about them. <laughs> well, before we shift too far, um, and this is something that we haven't talked about too much, but you, I know you talked to Anna in your previous um, interview um, to mark the, the painting show, but you were talking, and I just think it's something that's very um, pertinent to your work, about movies and especially old movies and sort of Technicolor movies and how that kind of light and colour has fed into how you make your paintings. Yeah, I think... Um, 1970s movies, 1970s even though we're both movies. slightly too young to... I know, I had this <laughs> weird fascination with like Mary Tyler Moore as well, for a while. <laughs> and especially like when I turned 30, I was like, I'm gonna watch Mary Tyler Moore. For, Cause she turned, like she was 30 in the first season. And it was almost like each season was following her through her 30s. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm gonna watch each season during each year of my 30s, and then I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be Mary Tyler Moore. And I mean, she, she was based in Minneapolis, so it's very close to where I was. But there was that kind of like cool apartment, like she had these great colors. So I guess that was one influence. The Shining, oddly, mm -hmm. I, you know, mm -hmm. I had a dad who sort of would probably show me films maybe that weren't appropriate, but really stuck. You know, when I was three, The Shining was like my absolute favorite movie. And I just remember like, the red, like give me more red. And I think you see that in the work. <laughs> it's sort of embarrassing, but it's true. And um, you it, know. It has that, it has like a 70s feel to me. I don't know why. Quite a lot of the, I guess these spaces, but maybe it's something to do with those films like Shining or Clockwork Orange, or like, I don't know, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Something about those atmospheres. Mm. I don't get that. Does anyone else get that? <laughs> but also, actually, the only the films that you conscious that you referenced are Hitchcock movies, which are just oh, all yeah, black yeah. and white yeah, in my yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. But then the birds, you know, that's not. Is it? No, that's not. The birds isn't black and white, is mm. it? No, no it's no, not. Not okay. at all. Okay. Um, the this one with the bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's about Hitchcock's dogs. That's about Hitchcock's dogs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I was the one who googled their you, names. You googled their names, but um, yeah, the the dogs came in kind of as a last minute thing because it, it, that's my grandparents' bedroom um, at the lake home, and I remember sort of feeling like it just wasn't done, but I wanted to add a dog, and I did add a dog. The dog has moved around that whole bed a few times. And it just didn't feel right. And finally, I put in the black dog. And I was like, it needs a white dog, too. And then I was like, oh, it's like Hitchcock's dogs. And so it's like that piece of my past sort of influencing. And then it feels like it's done. Mm. And then also in that painting, you put in the rainbow and the gold wall. The rainbow, the gold wall. I mean, it was just like, it was a fascinating place. It seemed like it was always a fun bedroom, too. You know, you'd kind of go in there, and the grandma and grandpa had like silk sheets. So you'd go in, you'd slide. And, like, it was sort of like a fun house for me in a way. And so I think I wanted to bring that sort of element of fun into the because painting. Because the the, the, it wasn't possible to paint the silk sheets. Right. So you had to give it some other kind of no. glamour that was, right. that was not there, but was, I think is a lovely example of how you're painting what you wanted to, what, what the memory was or what mm. the memory felt like and not mm. what was actually there, which was just a reasonably boring regular bedroom. Mm. <laughs> The other Hitchcock one, this is a classic example of like me reading into things that possibly aren't there, but I think the shower one, it, it reeks of Hitchcock to me. Um, and because I'm writing consistently about Molly's work, I have this lovely paragraph about how um, in Hitchcock's Psycho, that scene in the shower um, was like, there's a whole documentary just about the shower scene. And there was something like 78 different camera setups and 52 takes or something. And it was all about kind of um, nothing happening, I guess, setting up the atmosphere in order for the, the major thing to happen. And that fit in it into actually what you had written about it. Yeah, so that story is about my, my mom. She was probably like 16 and she went to take a shower. And so she, she was in the shower, she's taking a shower and she looks up and there was a bat like in the shower. And I mean, a 16 year old. She just freaked out and it was like, so then I grew up hearing about this story about my mom getting scared by the bat. But so I started making the painting and then I put the bat in the shower and, then, 
but then I wanted, I added the, shou the, the shadow of her coming into the room. So, and the title of it is Before It Was a Story. So I wanted to paint the moments before my mom knew what was gonna happen. It was almost like I was seeing it. I knew it was gonna happen, but I wanted it. I wanted it to be before it actually happened. Yeah, yeah, which was the shower scene in Hitchcock. It was yeah. all kind of about building up to that mm. dramatic moment. Yeah. Um, and the, the, this one over here is also after a Hitchcock movie. <laughs> which the... Uh... Rope. Rope, yes. The, the title comes from a Hitchcock film, which is sort of a hilarious story as well. I was working in a garden center and there was a guy who was coming there quite frequently, finding me, like, uh, I think, and eventually did ask me out on a date, but he was trying to impress me with his, in, his knowledge of Hitchcock, which he had more knowledge than I did, and he mentioned the film Rope, which is actually like a brilliant film, so then I went home and watched it. It's shot in one shot. Um, but that relationship did not last, but then I did find a new relationship, and it has lasted. Now I'm married, um, but he has actually, um, one of the hangers in his room, has a rope to hang all of his clothes. So there's sort of a line there that I found for the title, I guess. Mm -hmm. That was also, you know, very much just a functional structural thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Before I like twist into the, what I think of, to, I think of this series very much as in like first half and second half. And the first half is the, the paintings that were shown in the Molesworth exhibition. And then the second half is um, what's happened since then, really, which is more about bringing, bringing us up to speed. Mm -hmm. But before, I just wanted to ask you about um, the title of the Molesworth show and uh, the title of the Molesworth show where dreams are important. Dreams are important. And I loved that connection to dreams because um, to me, Molly's paintings have, the perspective gives me a sense of how I dream in a way that there's never any, I think I actually say this in the essay, um, but it's, it, there's never any uh, clear perspective in your dreams. Sometimes you're over here, sometimes you're over there, you know, things sort of switch around quickly or the walls move or things slide past. Um, and that is always very present to me in your paintings in the same way that we remember things slightly wrong, you know, slightly out of place. Um, but, but remind me, what was the meaning of the title of the show? So the meaning of the title of the show was mainly, um, do you know, because that show did relate to my grandmother a little bit, and I think about like where she started and where she ended up. I think she did have this dream, the, the, you know, the American dream, maybe, but like she fulfilled something in herself that mm, I think seemed slightly impossible. And, and then I started encountering my own, I mean, we all do, we all have our problems, right? Um, but I sort of like held on to this sort of hope that whatever dream you have to do something, even if it's a struggle, even if it is sitting down with a new friend and saying, how do you make it? How do you do this? It's like, well, we both have this dream of living this life this one way and it's important. And we have to stick to it. But also in the way that like, sometimes you have those dreams that wake you up in the middle of the night that are like, sticks with you all day, but not in a bad way, that that's also important. Like there's sort of that smallness and bigness, I suppose. And something we've talked about quite a bit is um, of the handful of things that Molly has brought into my life. There's been like, you know, an appreciation for herbal teas and <laughs> <laughs> barley cup. And, but one of them is like, we've talked a lot about what Molly calls woo woo or woo. And, you know, to me, it's the supernatural. And, like, I think it's peppered throughout this show, but in a kind of a subtle way, that partly it's there in the, in the way you look down on things and into things. But there's also, like, a scattering of stars that repeats. And I, I don't know whether this relates to astrology or this kind of second half of the story, um, or whether it's a bit like in the painting of the bedroom, that it's about kind of acknowledging the forces around us that that are there too and influencing everything. Mm. Yeah, I, so. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't really know where to expand on that. Well, um, well, I'll give you, I'll give you a yeah. story you yeah. can tell. Actually, okay. to go back to the bird painting and the cloud. Oh yeah, yeah. You didn't write it in the text, so maybe I shouldn't. I shouldn't. No, disclose. I don't care. But that Open cloud. Book. You told me distinctly that you'd seen that cloud during a psychic meditation. Yeah, yeah. I had seen after it. you painted it. After you painted it. 
Was it after? I think so, because you were like, I painted the cloud and then I had a sort of vision of the cloud or I saw the cloud. Okay, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. It was the, actually the cloud came to me in some sort of a, like, I think it was like one of those half dreams. And then uh, it kind of appeared like on an image that I had taken and then I painted it. But then I was walking to or from some healing therapy that I needed. Um, and I saw the exact cloud like in the sky. And that, so, but that was after, so it was sort of before and after, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But those things influence. They do influence, and I, I would say, I think you've written about it, is like, I'm, I'm skeptical. I don't believe in it, really, but I mm. do. <laughs> and so I, I kind of like, when the you signs show it. up, you're like, oh, you again. I was, I was almost giving up on this one, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's Molly would tell me the story of some appointment that she'd been to, but sort of laughing at herself, and I couldn't figure this out. I was like, are you taking this seriously? Or are we <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it's curiosity, you know, you're curious, as opposed to, you know, have full faith in it. Um, the, the kind of, um, like, I, I suppose I should say that I've been writing about Molly for about a year now, and the start of this was when um, uh, she asked me to write something short, and I I have written about artists before, it's something I do occasionally, but I've never actually like known them quite intimately as people. So I was instantly excited. I was like, oh, I have loads of material, like loads of random superfluous detail. And I got kind of carried away. But one of the first things that, that I was kind of in awe of was how self-contained your existence was. It was this compact cabin, cabin and everything was life and art were completely intertwined, you know. So one second you were at an easel, next you were baking or feeding your sourdough starter. Um, and it was kind of, a, and I kind of idealized this in a way because I feel that my life is sort of cluttered and full of, sort of other responsibilities. And I, and I sort of, I was in awe of this. I was drawn to your self-contained spare single existence. <laughs> and then the story of this series of paintings in a way has been that being dismantled. So at a certain point, the events of your life changed and instead of continuing to paint, well, you've continued to paint memory, but it's become about painting rec the recent past. And I mean, maybe if you tell us about the series of drawings, because I think that's the best example of it in the show. Okay, um, I think maybe the, probably the best way to answer this is I think I was painting from my past and I had built a really, good life for myself in Ireland at this point. I was self-contained. I was well happy. Um, but there was... Splendid isolation. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then things shifted. I, it's like, I want to say I accidentally met someone um, that I was not expecting whatsoever. And <laughs> we met on an app and he's in Sweden. Um, and we had chatted for about four months and then we decided that, yeah, we should meet. And so I went to Sweden and everything. I mean, I was like, oh, shit. You know, like that, that sort of self-contained life I knew had been shattered at that point because this person was like changing my life immediately. So even on the flight back to Ireland, I, I started making drawings of our weekend together. Um, as an act of remembering, in a way, yeah, even was, though it had just happened. Yeah, and, and so all of a sudden it was like, forget the grandparents, let's go for like what just happened on Saturday. And it was like, you know, and I started like, I suppose that is where it started. And because it was a relationship that was new, um, it, was, it was very committed, but it wasn't like forever. I, he wasn't getting on a painting yet, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, was it, can I ask, like, and I don't know if I've asked you this before, like, was it a struggle to change what you had already, I, like, for me, it would be like, I have decided I'm doing this project and I'm going to do it to the bitter end no matter what happens in my life. But you were more, like, did you fight that for a while? Were you like, I'm not changing my... No, but I feel like that's something that happens. And I, I feel like you would also do the same thing because I think there's a point where you reach where you understand your process enough that you know that like when when something I don't know you've you've beaten something to death 
and like all you're gonna do is look like an idiot and you're gonna make dead paintings. Mm -hmm. um, and so you just have to go with wherever it's going. And I just thought, okay, you either make probably better work and change your direction and make it work, or you keep making these paintings and they're gonna be boring. And not only to you, but for anyone else who's looking at them. And so I think, but it takes kind of years of, and, and I mean my trajectory as a painter is I've changed styles a few times. I tried out a lot of different ways. Um, and each time I've reached a dead end almost. And now this was sort of an unlocking of that and saying, it's okay, like just change now so you're not getting to that corner again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rather than have painted the rest of the grandmother paintings uh, in a kind of dead robotic kind of way. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, but also like there's a fair mix already of reality and because this painting specifically mm. is, well, you tell it, is the lake home. That's the lake home, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was actually, it was a cul-de-sac where you would drive around and then you'd park here, uh, you know, to go into the lake home. And then um, this was just a big grassy area. We'd go and like play catch or whatever. Um, the tree came down in a like massive storm at one point. It's actually where my parents had their wedding dance um, and whatnot. And that was kind of the painting. But then I was in the cabin one day and a tree surgeon had come over um, one day uh, to do some work around, around the area. And he had brought his three large deer hounds. And these are well known, I think, around Bali de Hob. The and tree like, surgeon and his deer hounds. I mean, they're like <laughs> as tall as me. They're huge. And they're just like, oh, they're so lovely. And one just waltzed into the cabin. And I mean, it, it, it filled the cabin to the point where I was like, it, it could reach up to the countertop and was kind of looking around, but it was really graceful. And I just had this like affinity for this deer hound. And it was, and I kind of, you know, drawn it like kind of as a life thing. So I was like, oh, here's an opportunity. And, um, and the, the, you know, a tree surgeon left, blah, blah, blah. it was a few weeks went by and I was like, oh, I need the deer hound in the painting. And I don't know why, but it, the, 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 I put the, the, the deer hound in and all of a sudden I was like, that's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were creeping in, like. But I think my favorite story of the deer hound, though, is that this is the woo woo stuff. Mm -hmm. Is like uh, when we went to Dublin, we had gone up <laughs> for Dublin for like a different event, you and I, and we were walking around Dublin, and it was so strange. City center, we started seeing seeing literally deer hounds everywhere. Well, no, there was this man posing with deer hounds in a kind of a like I have just stepped out of Irish folklore and the tourists when I take a picture of me in the deer hands. Yeah, so this is where Woo Woo comes like, in and I'm like, can't disregard it. Yeah, it was such a strange spectacle. I'd never mm. seen that guy before. Um, what I've loved in the last year or so is seeing, like I've seen these paintings sort of begin and then gradually build. So like I'll come back like a month after. The Pelicans is, is probably my best example because I remember you coming back from America and first there were pelicans and you were like, do they look like pelicans? And then, and then there was the one that's flying. <laughs> and then eventually there were the pylons in the corner. But this was maybe, you know, maybe, I don't know, three different lunches or something. <laughs> but I, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, the process, I suppose, or the slowness, you know, why you sit with these paintings for a long time mm -hmm. and you add to them piece by piece. Yeah, I feel like it's it's a tricky conversation to have about like how long you spend on a painting because really I probably don't spend a lot of time putting like a brush with paint mm -hmm. onto the painting, but I spend a lot of time sitting with the painting wondering like how do I make this work? How do I bring back that thing that was working in the event? Um, you know, it's erasing, it's it, yeah, it's it's a weird I don't, it's not even a fight, like it's just kind of like hanging out and waiting to almost talk back to it with a brush. Mm. There's, a, there's different paintings going on simultaneous. Yeah, yeah, there's usually around four to five paintings kind of like rotating each in their own stage. On the of, floor, yeah. on the fridge, leaning against the fridge, you know, on that tiny little bench where you yeah, serve food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's all, they're very close, but they're happening simultaneously. And they're all like, I, like I, I've never painted, I'm not a painter, but 
but it was wonderful to me to discover that they're all sort of a mustard yellow underneath. Yeah, the, so you stain the, the canvas under, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stretch the canvas over this, the, the panel and then I cover it in a, like, a, a, something bright, an ochre or something, so if by chance, like, any, if I don't, if the paint does not cover the entire surface that is rough, you're getting a yellow or a green, and you wouldn't see it unless you look really close, but I mean, that's a lot nicer to the eye than a stark white. So there's, a, and these are things that like, it takes you 10 years to say, right, I need to stain that before I move on to the next step or else I'm screwed in the end, you know, sort of. Yeah, yeah, and that I would never think to notice unless I had seen them, you know, <coughs> slowly coming about. Mm. Um, the painting that marks the end of the series, I think for you, or in my mind as well, is the one painting that looks into the future as opposed to, uh, as opposed to remembering either the, I mean, to me, they're all about memory, but some of the memories are recent and some of them are less recent. Um, and they're all something we've also talked about quite a bit is um, our tendency to like auto fiction, you know, auto fiction being a literary genre that is about, um, you know, I guess writing about your life, but sort of lying along the way. And you, this is something you talked about with Anna before, that this is what your paintings do only with painting. Yeah, I mean, I guess it gives you greater freedom in terms of like, these are stories about my life, but they're also like, how do I make a viewer look at these paintings and sort of like emulate the same feelings that I have? And so in that, maybe I'm telling some sort of lie by like putting stars like in a corner or to like embellishing the future kitchen that my husband and I will have but it's trying to like imagine my feeling in a way. And so I think that's where you take those liberties, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the, I was gonna mention some of the influences along the way that Molly and I have been sort of having a creative exchange and that we've been exchanging novels, but also um, painters and painting. And I've learned so much um, but one of the first books that you gave me, I think, was um, Letters to Gwen John by Celia Paul. Um, she's a London-based painter. Um, but it was Gwen John, I think, who you were more interested in when you gave me the book, because mm. I'd read Celia Paul's previous book, Self-Portrait, and I was interested in Celia Paul. But you were kind of more interested in Gwen John and perhaps writers of a slightly of that kind of generation. Um, Do you want to say a bit about influence? Well, of... Um, of Gwen John and sort of Paula Modus and Becker and kind of turn of the century painters rather than Current, contemporary, contemporary painters. painters. I would say like Celia Paul has been a huge influence in terms of how she lives her life. I would say Gwen John has been more of an influence in how she has used paint. Mm -hmm. And Gwen John um, was turn of the century. She uh, had a kind of difficult relationship with Rodin. She kind of moved to Paris to to try and be his lover and like he wasn't always up for it mm. and sort of a tragic story but she kept painting through it and her paintings are really delicate and they're always very small but she's just um i've always had an affinity for her mm. and so celia paul wrote this this book about she's just written letters to gwen john and so she knows this person's dead and she's in the past but it's kind of like a female to female uh, exchange on what it's like to live this sort of life. And Celia Paul was also um, the wife of Lucian Freud and then divorced, and so she had the same kind of relationship. So it was a really interesting um, book. I mean, I've never had a relationship with someone so famous, but um, there yeah, was something about the sort of the struggle of being like a female painter, I suppose, in both of them. Yeah, and Paula Modis and Becker, the same, really, because mm. she... Um, she was sort of <laughs> trying to give up paint or trying to give up her sort of conventional life and go to Paris and paint. And, mm. But the other painters who came up were Alice Neal. Um, I remember you going to Sweden at some point and coming back uh, with a Mama Anderson catalog. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, uh, coming with a beautiful um, Wilhelm Hammershoi book, mm -hmm. some day that we, that we looked at over the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you want to? 
talk a little bit about rooms. Rooms. Maybe the, <laughs> I think that was the connection to Hammershoy. Hammershoy, yeah. I don't know if anyone knows him. I mean, I didn't. But he, he's great at like white, empty rooms and women sitting quietly in rooms. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's funny. These are the things that are very subconscious. They just come in the idea or, or rooms. I think, but I'm I'm just I think I'm enamored with the domestic, and so I'm gravitating towards domestic painters who are painting people who are in and out of their lives, um, rather than something outside of a daily life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you saw the Philip. Augustine exhibition as well mm -hmm. while we were working on this and one of the books that you recommended me was uh, Night Studio uh, which was a memoir by his daughter which again was very much I mean what I liked about that was sort of the domestic in a way you're getting a memoir by a very famous painter's daughter that kind of boils down to you know the the, the, the hard facts of life mm. um, before we get to sort of the open questions bit um, I wanted to ask about identity, like it's a big question, but it's something that Molly and I have talked about a lot um, because both of us have sort of harbored this outsider complex, I suppose. And I think it's something that most artists and writers have that for some reason they feel like they haven't quite fit it into their moment in time or the place where they live or their family um, and that that's had a big influence on them. Um, and so we've talked a lot about Molly has said to me on a number of occasions that she feels like an Irish painter. And of course, I've been kind of like, oh, <laughs> you're American. But the more that we kind of thrashed it out, you know, what you would say is that, but Ireland made me a painter. Um, yeah. You look skeptical now. <laughs> no, no, I'm not skeptical at all. It's just, I, I guess, I don't know, you know, I, I went to the Burren in 2012, and the reason I even mm. came to the Burren was. It wasn't because my grandmother had, so she was born in Wandsworth, but she was Irish. Like yes, so it's, she was Irish. Yes, I, I mean, Irish I, I almost like kind of say, oh, she grew up in London. Like I'm nervous saying that because I don't think she'd actually be happy with that. I think she's Irish. Mm. Um, but that wasn't why I came here. I came here because I saw a picture of a Bear Mountain, and I was like, and I can do an MFA there. Sold, you know. <laughs> um, so I I went to the Burren, I painted. You know, I lived that kind of weird, solitary life, like really weirdly. And then within my first year, I had kind of been catapulted into the Irish art scene and welcomed. And it was, it, it, I mean, it was, it was overwhelming and in the best way. And suddenly um, things started going. And, and it's when I finally found my footing in terms of like a career. Painting was always there, but the career started to happen. And so that's why I would say I'm, I'm an Irish painter because that's where I've set, set foot as a painter mm -hmm. in the contemporary art scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, and I think, you know, that made total sense to me. Um, even though only recently have you started painting little scenes from here, you know, I feel like, I feel like you're slightly, like a lot of like Joyce who was living in Trieste, but writing Ulysses, which was, you know, forensically looking at the back streets of, of Dublin. I feel like the more you're away from a place, the more you'll paint it. So perhaps you need to leave Ireland in order to, for the Irish paintings to really start coming out. Some of them are Irish, like I should acknowledge myself in some of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lab. Uh, yes, yeah, this, this one here, actually, that's, I love this one because... The ghost. It just looks, you know, it, it looks like something perhaps supernatural or... Uh, but it is in fact um, Lep, which is a little town in West Cork that has a scarecrow festival every October, November. And they, the whole town, it just goes bonkers. They're like so it's, good. Like, it's so good. You it's full go. of scarecrows. And a lot of them are kind of satirical, political scarecrows. And then a lot of them are like, you know, giant spiders eating decapitated children and stuff. And then there's ghosts hanging in all of the trees. Um, but it's a very weird thing to see. If, so what I like about the painting is that it looks like fanciful, you know, it looks whimsical, but it's in fact exactly what it looks like on that back road from Lep at a certain time of year. <laughs> um, it's, there's about 10 minutes to seven, just under, and then I have a little spiel about Tolka, and then we can relax and mingle and have a drink. But I would love people to ask questions. Um, I meant to say at the beginning that there would be a few minutes for questions if anyone wanted to ask questions. Um, 
But if, if you don't, I can go on. Yes, please. Um, I spent like a lot of time with paintings, and it was very enjoyable. But I was really interested how the perspective changes. In so lots of them are your memory, and, and I read the text pieces, and then in three of them, it's you're looking at yourself. So you're painting yourself in them. The the rest rest of them. Mm -hmm. And I found that interesting. I'm trying to think, so that I'm looking at myself there, there, and there. The yeah. Mm. And also the train. train. Yeah. Over, yeah, and the train. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. perspective The perspective shifts when I paint myself inside the painting. Or does it? I just, I noticed it. Yeah, I guess I've never even thought of that. Um, but I feel like you know, I, I, in a way, I started to see myself in these memories rather than viewing them even of, of the, like, past, past, even before I was born, such as the, the one in the shower. Um, yeah, and I feel like as they become more and more present, um, I remember myself in the situation more, I suppose. And to me, that's like the kind of, what I was talking about with dreams. Because you know the way sometimes you're in your dream and then sometimes you're watching your dream like a film or maybe it's just me. <laughs> but that's what the paintings are a bit like to me. Sometimes you're looking, you're kind of disembodied and you're seeing things. And then other times you're, you're in them, you're actively participating. Mm -hmm. Hello. <laughs> Sarah, your next book is, um, sorry, I'll let you go, sorry. Uh, your next book, uh, your, you, Molly is your muse for this next book. Can you tell us more about what that? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm reluctant to say it's anything fixed as in, but I have been writing uh, one of them as an introduction to Talker Journal. I have an essay in this journal, which we're, we have copies of here tonight. Um, it, I guess it's an opportunity to read a piece of writing about Molly, sort of in the style, I suppose, of this talk. Um, but. Yeah, she asked me to start writing about her, and I did, and found that there was an awful lot of material. Um, and then her life became sort of very hectic and chaotic. And I was like, oh no, this is too exciting for me. I only write very boring books where nothing happens. <laughs> but I asked you to write a piece. Like, I didn't ask you to write a book about me. No, no, you no didn't. sorry. No, I was like, didn't. no, I did not ask her to write a book about me. I asked her to write um, an essay. An, an essay. Yeah. Do you know often with, when you, you have these exhibitions, you would ask a writer to write a piece. So I, I said, Sarah, would you mind writing a piece for this Molesworth exhibition? Mm -hmm. And that's where things, you approach me and you kind of, I, I, I distinctly remember, remember us sitting down in the grass and you kind of nervously were like, you're my next book. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. okay. You know, and it was, and then things sort of got rolling there that it was, well, what, what interests me is that, I mean, it's sort of memoir as well, but I don't read a lot of books. I think a lot of artists, or a lot of writers, tend to take an artist from a previous generation, say, or someone who's sort of died in tragic circumstances, or a woman artist who's been completely, you know, uh, overlooked during their lifetime. But I, I don't see a lot of books about artists, or a lot of close studies of artists who aren't necessarily world famous, but are who, who are living and working now, you know? And, and so why not write about, write about it now? Why not write about my contemporary? Um, so, I mean, it's by no means a conventional book. And it's full of shit from my own life as well. So it's not just, <laughs> it's not completely exposing, I don't think. Um, and it's also about friendship and perhaps, um, uh, and, and painting and other painters from the books that we've shared. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of things going on at the moment. I don't normally ever talk about books while I'm writing them, but I feel like this one might be hard just to get published. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to do in the hype now. I'm so sorry, you had a question. <laughs> I was just wondering, what, uh, when does the text come into the process? Um, is it when the painting's finished? Or just wondering, Nina, how, how that happens? Mm -hmm. These are these texts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, it's actually a new thing in a way for me. It was literally, it was before Christmas and I, um, 
I had finished the work and it was mainly just sort of Anna and I, I've been having some like weird things going on in my life and Anna has been so busy in getting down to Bali to Hob to see me and, and so instead of doing a studio visit we've been doing everything through email and then I thought right she needs to know as much as she can about this exhibition and so I shared a word document with her and I said I'll just write about each painting so you can get the backstory and I had these blurbs like this and every every painting does have a story and so that I, I had that document we were starting to hang the show and then you said why don't we put this next to the painting and I was like yes let's do that I think it you know it really gives people the story behind the painting um, and and that's how it's come to be but all of a sudden I think that's completely it was like one of those like mind-blowing things but now but it was more like exposed blowing like this is now a thing in your practice so I don't know at all it's just there now and I I hope to do something with it eventually because I think it's something that makes my work distinctive and it's also really important to my paintings yeah I think it's really brave to tell the story because it's very, it's, it's easy not to in a way. Um, but they all have stories, the paintings. And so, you know, and so why not, why not tell them? Um, it's, y painting can be very kind of exclusive in a way, perhaps more so than the other arts. Um, and this makes it a bit more um, inclusive, I think. I think, I think it's good. I think it's brave. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, I can just add to that. It's just because you talk about being an Irish painter. It's very Irish to tell the story. So it is. Oh, very good. That's true. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> good point. I like that. No, that's, that's a great point. <laughs> that makes me happy. Mm -hmm. I just wondered in your process of getting, you know, choosing different memories or having different memories and putting them down on canvas, mm -hmm. did that clear the way, did other memories come up that you were more submerged maybe? Did, you, did that happen at all in that process, do you think? You know that once, you know, some maybe bigger images were always in your head, you know the way some childhood memories are always really super clear. Mm, mm. And then if you got that out of, your, some, out of your head onto something, did you find anything else, other things came up that you kind of forgot or were more hidden in your head? Or did you think about it before you put do you know what actually happens with me is like I live my life and then all of a sudden I'll be in a situation and I'll be like, oh, there's a painting. Like that's how it kind of works, I, especially the new works. The older works, I always had like, I, I literally had a list of things that I was like, if it would come into my head, I make a list. Of, oh, that's a painting. And then slowly that list started dwindling, but not growing. And I think maybe that goes back to your question too, of this evolution. But I remember you and I were on a train once and I I'd kind of felt that and I was like, this is a painting, you know. So I just kind of live my life and wait for those moments, I suppose now. So you do get them out and let you make a list? Mm, yeah. You kind of put them down. Some, you I think. Out of your head and put them somewhere in a physical space. Uh, yeah, or I just make like really rough like line. Oh, right. yeah. What your question made me think of actually was one of the stories that you tell us about, I think it's, I think it's this one actually, mm. is how when your sister saw that painting, she remembered a sound mm. that, one, that yeah, you had like, forgotten. Yeah, yeah, she was like, oh, I'll never forget the slamming door of that screen door. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh yeah, and now I think of that when I see that painting. Yeah. Molly, the writing is, you're really using a different muscle. As a painter, writing and narrative is so different to the painting process. I'm wondering, is your, has your friendship with Sarah encouraged that? Has that come out of that friendship more, or has that always been there? Because, I mean, I know there's a lot of people that would have gone around the show and, and really love the, 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 the labels and the um, uh, richness of the experience. And there are other painters or artists or people that I've run into that don't want the labels, that they find it prescriptive. Now, interesting of Gemma Tipton is writing a review uh, that will turn up in the Irish Times in the next uh, week. I know her copy is due tomorrow, so people should look out for that. And she was betwixt, but her mother loved it. She wasn't sure, but you know, it's, it, it does. It actually brings up a question for a, for the viewing of, of a painting. But I guess the question is, 
do you think your friendship with Sarah or that and, and a writer has encouraged that in a in a, a bigger way for you? Do you know, I think it's actually made me more afraid because it's like I'm not a writer, I'm a painter and but I also grew up I mean there's so there's layers to this is that I grew up and like by I think age 10 they told me that I had a learning disability in writing. And so I always just sort of said, well I can't write. And then I think in the last few years I've sort of said, well I can't write, that's fine, but I'll just kind of do it anyways. I started doing newsletter and things. And slowly it's it's crept in, but like the writing contributes to the painting. I don't know, I can't, I will never dedicate my life to writing. The, the no. famous last words, but do you know, um, like I am a painter and this is, but it, it becomes part of the work and I have no idea where it's going. Mm. Uh, we've talked about this because something I don't want to do is take away Molly's own story of the work or your own future book, you know, or if there's a book or whatever, the book that we all have inside us, you know, and. And we, I guess we've talked about how when, I'm, when, when you're writing about the paintings, she's writing uh, from the inside, you know, and I will never have that perspective. Whereas I'm writing more like an art critic would, I suppose. I'm looking, looking in at them from the outside. And I think with every art form, it's good to have, especially with visual art, it's good to have both those perspectives, to hear what the artist thought it was and why they painted it, but also how it sits in the world. You know, it's my role to, it's my role to see it in the context of, this moment in time, this place, you know, this um, this relationship or whatever. So I think there's I think there's there's a book there's Molly's book should <laughs> have a place in the world as well. And the same with all. I think painters especially. I always want to know the story and or the person. They just don't want to reveal that. They want you to to take whatever you take out of the painting. It's not like they don't they don't want to be handed the. The, the reading of the painting. No, no more than you don't even see pictures of painters, you know? Being sort of in this world of it is really interesting to me because you always know what the other writers look like because they always plunk a picture of them mm. next to their book in the paper, you know? <laughs> but write, or, write, artists never know what other artists look like. That's true, that's true. <laughs> Do we have another question or? I want to ask something. Um, I was really excited to come. I missed the first day I came here, I could. I want to know the two that I see at the door were there, whether they were chosen to draw us into the room. Was it just these that they two, were these two? Because they wanted to be hard. Um, so I have a strain. Um, when I finish the last painting, I finish the last painting, and I also feel like uh, Anna knows this space far better than I do. And I, I really trusted Anna, and so I just said, have at it, please hang, like just do what you think is best. And she did. And it's interesting actually, because when you come in the door, what you actually are seeing is you're seeing, this is the first half, these are the Lake series, and then this is the shift. This is like when Arvid came in to the work, when, my, when, when it became more present. So in a way, I don't know, it's more or less did you have that That's intention? Kind of, yeah. Okay. Talk yeah. about there being kind of two, a, an exhibition of two parts. Yeah. And so the middle, where we're kind of delineating that mm. viewing. In a way. Anyone? Will I do? Anyone? Anyone? That's good. Will yeah. I do my very brief blurb? Yeah. We have copies of Talka Journal, and they're going to be available also in the shop. It's kind of in lieu of a catalog, I suppose. And. There is a limited edition postcard that comes free with it of this painting. <laughs> um, but Tolka are um, a biannual literary journal of nonfiction based in Dublin. They were founded in autumn 2020 by um, Liam Harrison, Sean Hayes, and Catherine Hearn, none of whom could be here tonight, unfortunately. And it publishes all kinds of nonfiction from essays and memoir to reportage and autofiction. And it has a particular interest in promoting stylistically innovative and formis formally promiscuous writing. I can't even say it, but that's a nice way of putting it. And this particular issue has an essay by me called The Lake Home, which is about, like I say, the sort of first half, but also about how Molly lives and works, and one particular lunch we had, I think, back in May. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how much it is. It's 12, 12. 12. It's, a, it's a really nice buy. And there is yeah. also, yeah, essays There's a lot of I think, Irish writers in here. Rob Doyle, 
uh, Sinead Gleason. Sinead Gleason. Yeah. Um, yeah, Rodriguez Valo, Sean Hewitt. That's yeah. Good. Um, so, really good essays, actually. Yeah, I enjoyed it. So, yeah. So, um, and I think we're having a little sort of launch of that now. And a glass yeah. of wine. So, so people can buy at the front desk, you can go and buy a glass of wine in the cafe, come back and talk to Molly and Sarah if you like. Mm -hmm. But if there isn't any other questions, I think we can just say thank you to both of you. Thank you all well, for thank coming. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.